oceanic merging with Terra. That's the melting falling apart. <laughs> the negative Objective identification is scary to both sides. Yeah. What's wrong with the melting and falling apart? Mm. Mm. It's scary it's like shit. My God. Oh, there. Chantal's answer. Okay. <laughs> it's scary like shit. <laughs> Triggers. This is a nice metaphor. It's not directly this stuff, but might be a, a decent setup. Oh my gosh. Like, I thought I was getting better. Why is this coming up? What's your advice to people who are dealing with triggers when they're on the road to uh, recovery from trauma? When you say, why is this coming up like that? That's not a question. It's a statement. It's a statement that says, this shouldn't be happening to me. Okay. Now you ain't going to learn anything that way. But if you actually ask it, hmm, I wonder why this is coming up. Now you can learn something. If I came to you and said, why are you doing this? How would that feel to you? I would get, probably get defensive and I would just feel like a little ashamed. Exactly. But what if I said, hmm, I wonder why you're doing this? It would force me to think a little bit and practice the pause and say... Well, I don't know if it would force you, but at least they would invite you, right? Right, right, right. It's a good question, but we have to ask it as a question, not as a statement of resentment or resistance. That's the first point. The second point is use the word trigger. Really great word. Now, if I showed you a rifle with a trigger, how big a part of the rifle is the trigger? It's very small very small. For that trigger to set off anything, that what there has to be, there has to be a mechanism to deliver ammunition, there has to be ammunition, there has to be an explosive charge. Let's say you say something to me and I get triggered. What you said was a very small little thing. I'm the one who's got the explosive charge and the ammunition. You didn't cause me to do that. If I didn't have that ammunition explosive charge, you could say whatever you want. And I just sit here saying, hmm, I wonder why he's saying that. You know, mm -hmm. so triggering is a great opportunity to learn. When you get triggered, you could either focus on resent and resist the trigger, or you could say, or, huh, what was I still carrying inside that I haven't looked at yet, that I haven't resolved yet? So how I respond is not dependent on the external event. It's dependent on what charge I'm carrying. So triggers are wonderful times to learn about yourself. Triggers are wonderful times, but emotional charge is... Explosive. So even though you describe triggers as lighter, you're still dealing with charge. Or spinning. Or tons of bullets from being triggered. This is a little bit of a wordsmith. How much can we stay with our triggers when we're triggered? Maybe it's up to somebody else to have a co-historian to help you remind you that the, there's more to the trigger. But in the midst of being triggered and being flooded and being dealing with your charge, you're going to focus on the trigger and try to stop it. Maybe it's not up to you to investigate the trigger. It's up to you to have somebody else or journaling or some mechanism that allows you to be curious about the explosive charge. So if you ask the question, not well, why did I react that way? But, huh, I wonder why I reacted that way. Now, there's a whole lot of learning to be done. So that's what I call compassionate curiosity, where we're actually curious about ourselves, but not in a self-judgmental way but in a compassionate way. Oh, this brought up the pain of rejection. Obviously, I'm still carrying that, that wound. Well, let's look at that. Now, here's a potential angle. So the question, the phrasing. Oh my gosh, like I thought I was getting better. Why is this coming up? What's your advice to people who... I thought I was getting better. Why oh is gosh, this coming like up? I thought I was getting better. Why is this coming up? Could that be oceanic merging? Your superego flooding your system saying, panic, fuck, annihilation's around the corner. 
is that flooding yourself inside. <laughs> Why aren't we calling that flooding oceanic merging? I would never come up with that idea. It doesn't feel as... If we had, like, new people here that were sort of flooded by their flashbacks, they would bully people here to gaslight them with validation. They want to be flooded with other people's superego validation. They want oceanic merging from some sort of love bombing. How much of our self-help is flooding ourselves with self-help, with fantasy, with beating ourselves up, shaping up, shaping ourselves into some fixable mold? How much are we triggering annihilation and anxiety for our exiles <laughs> with oceanic merging? That oceanic merging or that, that invitation to do that is triggering me to feel like I'm being instrumentalized and I keep fighting against it. So you have a part of you that feels instrumentalized and that part is Holly's fight. Yeah, my have fight. Have you seen Holly's fight? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Holly has some big fight. So, so what? Oh, so what? Oh, so what? I'm the one who's wrong, You're in right? the judges. I'm the one You're who's in the wrong, judges. Right? You're in the judges. So Holly gives us a gift that she has an inner child that will fight against being flooded. <laughs> but at the same time, maybe she doesn't have access to the flooding superego energy, which might be useful. So it might be useful to have two sides, an id that can scream for being violated and a superego that can oceanic merge and keep things in order. Well, isn't it my ego that would balance that? A healthy ego. An ego would be a reality tester that would navigate id desires and superego moral uh, conscience space and try to navigate life so you're meeting both long-term and short-term needs. Correct? Yes, yes. So projective identification. I thought that might be easier, or no, it's actually harder, but that might be an easier dosed way to look at annihilation anxiety. And then maybe uh, destigmatize annihilation anxiety, because maybe we're using annihilation anxiety in small doses already for self-help and superego, toxic superego injunctions and moral, moral outrage. They're all little bits of annihilation anxiety. Mm. or inner children abuse to try to control things and force things in, in order but then the inner children get resentful and react or it triggers like more primitive defenses that come in and try to defense defend the inner children or destroy other people's inner children and it's a nice mess of oceanic merging So this is from the Jungian Life a channel with like three Jungian experts who over describe stuff. But, and they take away all the emotion, but they're describing projective identification pretty good. Sometimes as adults, we will fall down into that primal level of consciousness, projecting a feeling into someone else and then subtly provoking that person mm -hmm. to demonstrate the feeling. Flooding somebody else with some sort of emotional contagion, oceanic merging that somehow 
induces them to doing some behavior. Demonstrate the feeling. So projective identification has a, a real interactional uh, component of I want you to feel something, to do something, to empathize with me, to pick up my feelings, to carry something for me. I think it's very important to emphasize <clears throat> the word interactional and open up your teeth real loud because apparently it's important when she shared that. <laughs> So maybe the secret is, can we talk about projective identification and annihilation anxiety and keep it light? That will be the tricky thing. This is really loaded territory. And it's unconscious to unconscious communication. That's the oceanic margin. So when we regress, when babies regress, our babies don't regress, babies are already there. They have to talk unconscious to unconscious because they don't have the language circuits. And parents are hardwired to listen, or mothers are hardwired to listen to the baby's needs. And if you've been parentified, and you've been tracking the infant part of your abuser, then you're hardwired to track their unconscious. So if unconscious communication is oceanic merging and it's flooding and it's a bit the other side of that, it is annihilation anxiety. That's why it's so fun. That's why it's so desperate. That's why we're so excited about it when we when we survive it, maybe. Maybe that's part of the the high of trauma bonding, the yumminess of that addictive quality. So maybe projective identification is addictive on both sides. Oceanic union. If we felt abandoned by our parents, we might project onto our partner that he's going to abandon us. The next part of it, the identification, is that the person who is receiving the projection feels an unconscious pull right. to behave in the way that matches the projection. Unconscious pull. This is magical. Why is this described so coldly? It has exactly. a self-fulfilling prophecy to it where you induce the other person to do the thing that you are worried that they'll do. What's important to know about projective identification is that it is unconscious. It is automatic and it comes straight from the unconscious. Oceanic union. Oceanic union. Maybe the annihilation anxiety is the superego doesn't like the idea that there's something like oceanic merging. Maybe the superego doesn't like the, that projective identification is unconscious to unconscious or id to id communication. But at the same time, maybe the superego is still using oceanic merging to flood the exiles. So that's kind of deceptive of the superego to <laughs> both dislike it, but also take advantage of the back door of oceanic union with another person. Straight from the unconscious. The psyche wants the safety and connection of that oceanic merging with another person. The traits of the distressed person comes distributed in the oceanic field, so there is no clear sense of where I am and where you are. This is a time to give yourself superego injunctions of setting boundaries, because Super egos are delusional enough to say boundaries, boundaries, boundaries are going to work under oceanic merging. <laughs> Look at the video while it's fading Clear away. Clear sense of where I am and where you are. 
Where are the boundaries when you're on a psychedelic trip? <laughs> Oceanic Union. And lost. They're lost. So there's no distance for boundaries. Boundaries, the distance that I can love me and you simultaneously. Distance simultaneously. Distance. There's no distance and there's no distance to move. Active sparring, they're always measuring out distance. You have to move. Distance. Move. Can't distance. Move. move. Active Merge. sparring, they're always. You don't even know this. Boundaries are the realization where I stop and you begin. I stop and you begin. I stop and you begin. But you're in oceanic merging. It's hypnotic. It's inducing. It's the safety and connection of that oceanic merging with another person. It feels like home. Yeah, it does. It feels so yummy. But it's also destructive yummy. So yes, it's not all good. It's hypnotic. The traits of the distressed person comes distributed in mm -hmm. the oceanic field. So there is no clear sense of where I am and where you are. Oceanic union. And if this person doesn't make me instantly happy, they are out the door splitting. Either my frustrations and needs are going to be met or the person is bad and I'm not going to be okay until I get somebody who is always yeah. going to be the good breast for gratifying, me. Gratifying, right? The other person yeah. should be gratifying. At all times. There's no tolerance for yeah. a frustration. Gratifying. At all times. What do some support groups feel like? A list of magical demands that the world should give people that's gratifying all the time and anybody who doesn't gratify and frustrates write them off cut them off set boundaries and be an asshole <laughs> and somehow magically you'll get gratified by just setting boundaries and, and playing victim or something Maybe they fall into oceanic merging. They don't want to leave oceanic merging. They don't want to differentiate, individuate. It's not safe. The fantasy in the womb, the shared fantasy is warm and yummy and boundaryless. Psychedelic trip. Oceanic union. Projective identification is really just communication. You don't have yes. the ability to re to really say, well, gosh, I am feeling really terrified. I need to really take that on board and maybe. This is the price, your voice to express your fear. Your voice to express I'm terrified gets lost in the oceanic merging. You've lost your language of agency. That really complicated book, but that's what they're talking about. <laughs> you lose your language of agency from the oceanic merging from the torturer or from the shared fantasy story, your voice of being annihilated from the oceanic merging, from your soul being lost somewhere, that is lost. You can't, you've forgotten how to express your fear. Then you go into a support group, you start expressing your fear from annihilation terror. They suffocate your fear and tell you things are good. <laughs> they tell you, set boundaries. They tell you to leave. They're also not witnessing your fear. They're not witnessing your grief. They're not holding space for your the agony of your soul. I can ask for empathy. It's like too much. So instead you revert to, let me see if I can make you feel as distressed as I feel. And that's the dance of projective identification. So amazing and yummy to just flood each other <laughs> to try to get the other person to feel your hurt <laughs> doesn't make sense but to ids id to id somehow that seems like fun it's a pattern that happens a lot so <laughs> oceanic union 
Doesn't that sound good? I should make that a meme. <laughs> Oceanic Union. He has like an ASMR voice. Oceanic Union. <laughs> You're kind of lashing out at someone. Unconsciously, let me induce you into having this, this big reaction. So it's like an invitation to dance. Oceanic Union. There's a nice framing. Projective identification is an invitation to dance in the Oceanic Union. I induce you by my rage and I try to get you to trigger your rage and throw moral outrage back. And we are both in this Oceanic Union of trauma bonding that goes nowhere until someone gets pushed out and then we find someone new to try to induce into this dance of outrage to outrage that goes nowhere. Because what's lost is the expression of the terror, of the fear, of the original wound. That's the explosive charge. But the explosive charge is a bit scarier. So, Oceanic Union you can just sort of drown into the flood. But the charge is scary. Fire is much scarier than drowning. It shouldn't be, because drowning is pretty bad. Oh, where's the sound? Actually, that's more exciting, because you can dance around the bullets. <laughs> but the charge, the charge of your core wound... That's scary. So since that's fire, somehow you think water is safer. <laughs> or you think smoke is safer. So that's gas. To get away from the charge, to get away from the fire. Oceanic merging. Oceanic Union. Okay. Oceanic Union. The passive aggressive person often has no sense of their own anger about something. This is that YouTube comment Great to awaken something. <laughs> Great to awaken something. Kelly joined in that comment war a little. This, that guy's passive aggressive. He doesn't know his own passive aggression. Let's see. Oceanic union. The passive aggressive person often has no sense of their own anger about something. And so they'll behave in ways that induce anger in other people mm -hmm. and then distance themselves because the other person is so unpleasant. And they, but they induce the anger through their passive aggressiveness. Because they feel, or they're acting like they want other people to fall into their dominant frame when the other person doesn't fall into the dominant frame and pushes them away and says, I need some space, I want to have my voice. Then they go, oh, people aren't friendly. <laughs> people are dysregulated. <laughs> I don't know why this pattern happens to me all the time. <laughs> I'm just so innocent and sane. Just, just everybody else who's crazy. Right? Zach even admitted that. <laughs> I asked Zach, Oh, you probably think everybody else is insane in the world, except you're the only sane person. <laughs> oh, that's a lovely idea. <laughs> Inside joke. Mm -hmm. Passive aggression. Mm -hmm. And then distance themselves because the other person is so unpleasant and they feel that they're being, you know, mistreated. Uh, Healing comes from recognizing what it is that we are disowning and to actually have conscious experience of the thing that we keep inducing in other people. Rage. Okay, so the fix by him. <laughs> recognizing what it is that we are disowning and to actually have 
conscious experience of the thing that we keep inducing in other people. To own what's lost in the oceanic union. <laughs> and what are some of the things that uh, the biggest thing that we disown? Rage and powerlessness are often heads and tails of the same coin. Rage and powerlessness. <laughs> And then underneath rage and hatred and moralizing is hatred, and hatred is... Your hatred is extremely important. It tells you what is missing inside you. Your hatred is extremely important. It tells you what is missing inside you. Your hatred is extremely important. It tells you what is missing inside you. And then hatred is this. Hatred is a sign of the complete loss of your boundaries in the presence of someone who is living out your shadow. Your boundaries are gone. Hatred is a sign of the complete loss of your boundaries in the presence of someone who is living out your shadow. Your boundaries So if hatred is a sign that your boundaries are gone, hatred might be a sign of oceanic union, oceanic merging, trauma bonding, intimacy, passion, Floatiness, flooding. But we labeled all these confusing labels to sort of weaken and dismiss and create this illusion that we're getting further away from annihilation anxiety, <laughs> that we're not all projective identifying. that oceanic union and emerging is happening all the time. Emotional contagion is everywhere. It's part of being human. It's so much fun. Those of you that are receiving these, maybe you'll be able to see how you're being provoked and be able to understand it differently and be somewhat more resilient and bring it to the forefront. It's like an invitation to dance. Oceanic union with another person. An invitation to dance. So maybe today I'll just cover oceanic merging and annihilation anxiety. Let's take a little break and go back to uh, Zoe. And she's not here. Start oh my god, pretty good, context. yeah. Start oh my god, pretty good, context. yeah. Start oh my god, pretty good, context. yeah. Oceanic union, distort time and space context. We're able to laugh about that. Start oh my god, pretty good, context. yeah. Start oh my god, pretty good, context. yeah. Start oh my god, pretty good, context. yeah. We heard three different people. So you got Rob going like grunting or groaning, right? <laughs> and then Kelly saying, saying oh something. My God. Yeah. And then so this is Oceanic Union. Three people are talking, maybe triggered by Pankaj's Oceanic Invitation. <laughs> Where are the boundaries? <laughs> Oceanic Union. It's very easy to achieve. We don't have to make it in some giant big thing. That's just a shell game to make the superego feel like you're in control. Oceanic Union is very easy to achieve. You just need to, to distort time space context. Oh my god, pretty good, yeah. Oh my god, pretty good, yeah. Oh my god, pretty good, yeah. And some people are really good at this. Except then they get lost in their own distortion. That's the downside of the schizoid defense. So. Listen to schizoid angst. Talk about his shame. Or, or no, let's do this one first. 
if I'm talking to somebody and I'm thinking, hmm, this is an interesting online sort of camaraderie that's being established, I will be transparent about that, especially if I know the person doesn't deal with the same kind of issues or whatever. I'll be really transparent about it early on because I don't want... I'm giving them the opportunity to understand something about me. He'll be really, really transparent early on. <laughs> and how I do that is I give a person an opportunity to really understand me if they accept me at my dominant frame, whatever bullshit I'm giving people. Because I'm I'm bullshitting myself with time distortion right here. <laughs> because I don't want... I'm giving them the opportunity to understand something about me. <laughs> I'm giving you an opportunity, so I'm giving you a service by just showing myself. You should just bow down to me because I have an amazing dominant schizoid frame playing god and just flooding everybody with oceanic merging and schizoid rejection all the time i don't know why i don't have more friends because i actually don't want friends because i have the porcupine dilemma <laughs> friends are scary so i'm gonna spend all my time to scare people off uh before they make any misapprehensions or misjudge situations because if somebody misjudges and misapprehends, that is a mortal sin to my life. I am no longer in oceanic merging if somebody sees some difference of me that I don't see. Then if they do, that's kind of on them, right? That's not on me, because I, I was very transparent about this. I was very transparent by giving you a black and white framing of me that you must accept in totality. I will call that transparency, <laughs> not authoritarianism, <laughs> rigidity, <laughs> whatever. So, um, so that's kind of how I like to approach it. So if like, I'll, I'll, I'll and I won't say it directly about them. I'll kind of be more like. Indirect to make things more confusing and oceanic merging. <laughs> Distort time and space context. Vague or like with the intent of kind of communicating what I don't want this, you know, thing that we're doing right now for whatever reason to become. I will communicate something along those lines of like, oh, you know, I'm the kind of person that likes to stay on topics and likes to talk about these things because I find some enjoyment in it, but I'm not really looking to like make any new big friends and hang out and stuff. Like I'll say something like that because I will define things I don't like. <laughs> I will give negative things here and then you're supposed to figure out the positive aim. Because <clears throat> I'm just good at saying that not this, not that, not that, not that, not good enough. <laughs> and that's counter will. <laughs> it's like out there right and if they decide oh well i don't want to talk to this guy anymore then i'm like okay that's fine but if they continue conversing with me and continue with the, with that being established following my mental puzzle my infinite bait to get you to zigzag all over the place <laughs> that's not my fault anymore so I kind of just said I set I set it up early on, because because uh, of that reason. <laughs> what kind of brother would schizoid angst be? Because I don't want to hurt people, I started thinking about how much <sighs> unintentional damage my resentment for the world and my hatred for feeling like some outcast or alien in my environment how much damage that could have done to somebody that was undergoing their own set of trauma and tribulations under a similar environment as myself because those are a bunch of words to describe 
A family member. A sister. <laughs> I could find as many words to depersonalize my family member <laughs> that maybe I unintentionally harmed <laughs> due to my resentment and hatred about humanity. Environment is myself. Because their version of it didn't make sense to me, I discarded it. Your story didn't make sense to me, so I just throw it away. <laughs> Your story is shit to me. <laughs> I discarded it. And I, I was so worried about avoiding my own suffering that I kind of sort of abandoned those kind of ethical duties that I've kind of really, really felt are now important to me as I'm older. I actually ended up drunk texting my sister apologizing because I was just so devastated and I failed in that thing. One of the things that I think helped me cope was I would blame it on to some degree on my youth but I couldn't do that after you said that story. This is a backdoor of schizoids so I think David E. shared that to us and Kelly maybe you tried that with the commenter that it seems like they have to take in people's stories and then reject it. They're good at rejecting, but they have to sort of oceanic merge it with it first somehow. So if you can somehow phrase your comments in a way that they they can't instantly reject it or reframe it, then, then they might have to feel stuff. <laughs> Well, I couldn't exactly run from the demon in my head, so I didn't really have a choice. So Shadowfall can't run from his demon, but maybe Schizoids are running from their own demon in their head. That they have a constant oceanic union with. <laughs> and then they're just... They're taking on the world's annihilation anxiety <laughs> to avoid their inner world. So they might be doing projective ident identification with everybody as a default to escape their inner chaos. So then they have the empty schizoid core and all the inner negatives because they've abandoned themselves, their true nature, and they're lost in hating the world and blaming the world. Which is reasonable. I mean, the world is pretty vicious to people that don't fit in. I I can sympathize with the schizoid's uh, anti-social position. I just don't have the skill to punish the world because I'm lazy. Those hard workers are trying to punish the world. The show is rough to hear. It's been a, a brain worm in my head for like a little bit now. I just hated everyone and everything. I did that too. I blamed them for no, as no, long as I, I could. But I, I, I hated, like I couldn't let go, and I still can't let go in many regards for my hatred of the manner in which human society has progressed. I might <laughs> hatred of the manner of which of how human society has progressed. <laughs> When did he get a vote for how human society progresses? <laughs> what, what, what position is he jumping in where he, his hatred or judgment of how human progression... <laughs> no one cares about his opinion of this. <laughs> None of us have a vote on how human progression... human progresses. I have hurt a lot of people that I never intended to hurt. With my complete indifference and isolation porcupine sort of dilemma is they they kind of feel this like weird loneliness and then they reach out and they think they find something and then ultimately that person that can't give them what they want vice versa and it just ends up being that person can't give them what they want he can't get gratified all the time <laughs> someone needs to be punished oceanic union Except schizoid position 
the splitting position is scary. That's my, I haven't figured out how to describe that, but that part. But on the receiving end of projective identification, it's scary. That's easier to, to understand. But the person who's splitting, the schizoid who's acting out all this resentment, the unexpressed thing is fear and terror, unresolved grief. There's tons of that underneath his resentment. He did his drunk phone call because all the grief was coming up and the guilt and called his sister. My brother sent like two emails within a couple decades apologizing for being a bad brother to me and my second brother. When he got flooded by something, I didn't know how to respond to it because some email out of context and how can I forgive him for being a bad brother and why is he putting me into God position? <laughs> but that's sort of the schizoid position, um, trying to figure out how to describe it. Like more pain for both parties. Both parties have a misunderstanding or miscommunication. Like that person that can't give them what they want and vice versa. And it just ends up being like more pain for both parties. Both parties have a misunderstanding or miscommunication as to what the other person's needs are. <laughs> so it's both people equally are miscommunicating. Sure. <laughs> Let's not do a survey of the majority or the people that are on the shared bridge. Let's just <laughs> give it equally while the no noise context fragmenter is the one who's actively confusing much more and how they can be balanced or met it's it's fucking grim their version of it didn't make sense to me i discarded it unintentional damage you don't want to hurt people their version of it didn't make sense to me i discarded it i discarded it i discarded it so this is a bit more extreme example of annihilation anxiety or maybe the schizoid position is is doing I've sometimes said the schizoid position is like uh, wrestling with uh, life anxiety <laughs> and then neurotic position is wrestling with death anxiety and then life or death anxiety is you get annihilated by oceanic union. So if I'm a schizoid and my dominant frame gets union with your dominant frame, I disappear. I lose the God position and that's terrifying. Because <laughs> I've taken the addictive quality of counter will and I'm wrestling with anybody else's willpower and that gives me an edge in the game. But that means I go nowhere in life because I'm not directing my positive will. I'm only judging anybody else and playing God. Sabotaging stuff. So they're sort of working with annihilation anxiety just like neurotics and everybody else. And this might be codependent version of Annihilation. Miss LX. How do you avoid codependency when you are in a master-slave relationship? Enmeshment and connection will be tolerated in a healthy connection because a healthy connection is unity, is two holes coming together. Enmeshment erases identity by seeking unity through annihilation of self. Annihilation of self. Oceanic union. Annihilation of self. Flooding. Outrage. Moralizing. 
counterfeit connection, shortcuts to emotional contagion. Be part of the mob. Annihilation of self. A slightly different pointer, but basically the same territory. Annihilation of self. Annihilation of self. In both cases, we end up with oneness. But in enmeshment, someone's identity has to die. Identity has to die. It's incredibly tough. Identity has to die. Here's my definition of enmeshment. The prevention or removal of personal expression, individual identity, emotional autonomy, and or physical privacy. Annihilation of self. That's enmeshment. Annihilation of enmeshment. This is how it shows up in DS dynamic. This is how it shows up in romantic relationships. Losing sight of self-care, friendships, and responsibilities when you're experiencing relational conflict. That identity has to die. Feelings of happiness and overall mood depend on the state of the relationship. That identity has to die. There's excessive anxiety during conflict and or compulsions to fix conflict out of fear of abandonment. That identity has to die. Your partner's moods and emotional states determine your mood and emotional state. That identity has to die. Conflict feels threatening, like it could damage the relationship or offend the other person. That identity has to die. The other person's dreams or changes feel worrisome if they don't involve you. That identity has to die. Someone's boundaries are regularly shut down or belittled by the enmeshed person. And as the enmeshed person, you feel a sense of anxiety when you are apart from the other person. Topics are regularly swept under the rug. And as a result, all of this enmeshed behavior creates distance. That identity has to die. Distance, emotional distance. It's going to be constant, exhausting boundary setting toward the enmeshed person. Because the enmeshed person needs to feel enmeshed to feel safe. Connection equals enmeshment to the enmeshed person. That identity has to die. Highly controlling. That identity has to it's die. Highly violating. That identity has to it die. It feels like love. It feels like a loving connection to the enmeshed person. Needs to feel enmeshed to feel safe. In a master-slave dynamic, it has to start, in my opinion, with the dominant, with the master. They have to be so full of power, authority, and security that they won't tolerate codependency and enmeshment. That identity has to die. That's enmeshment. Annihilation of self. That's enmeshment. Oceanic union. Identity has to die. Flooding. So in the journal post, I, a recent journal post, I theorized that voicelessness was what was one of the keys that codependents can't witness. That was the vulnerability video from 2020 and the one I showed a clip from last uh, two weeks ago that codependents can't witness voice, voicelessness. And then two weeks ago, the, my story from that was also didn't fall, didn't seem that people could witness, because witnessing my voicelessness would trigger your voiceless wounds. And if you have voiceless wounds that don't have expression, you want to keep that charge down. You don't want to open up the... So Miss LX talking about enmeshment identity has to die. Sort of the same territory. So somebody has a defense. That defense is threatening, or that defense triggers inner content charge. Somebody has to die. Moral outrage.
instead of a gift to welcome the potential trigger, the charge, pay attention inside, let me outrage and fight, fight out the old stuff. That is acting out paranoia, which I was playing with how to link to projective identification. So Lee Hammock and what was it? Ben Taylor, they both have owned their paranoia. The last uh, psyche valve I took back in February of this year came back narcissistic personality disorder and it so general anxiety can you describe more particulars on your flavor of anxiety <laughs> to Lee Hammock mental illness so that's, how does he answer the last uh, psyche valve I took back in February of this year came back narcissistic personality disorder and it, it spiked super high on paranoia and schizophrenia, schizophrenic trait. The, the high levels of paranoia leads to me being super anxious because I have a low, whole bunch of irrational fears. So it leads to me being super anxious about a lot of stuff that doesn't make sense to a lot of other people. What makes you anxious? The PDQ4 and the MMPI2 came back as NPD plus general anxiety. From what my therapist said, my grandfather was undiagnosed schizophrenic. He was 27 years old. He went into the bathroom one day and uh, took a, a pew pew and put it in his mouth and pulled the trigger. When he was 27 years old, 5.30 on a Monday morning, I think my dad found him. He was like six or seven years old. Right before school, you get up in the morning, you hear a pow, and instead of eating like Fruit Loops or Cinnamon Toast Crunch, you go in the bathroom and you find your uh, your dad Fruit with loops. a, a hole in his head because he unalived himself. And that, traumatized my father which made him kind of neglectful neglectful parent because there was no mental health help for seven eight year old little black boy in the 70s so they send you to school in a couple of days after you find after you found your father uh, unalive you go back to school you don't gotta go to the therapist you go back to school i had a lot of hatred for my father growing up because he was neglectful it wasn't it wasn't really there so his father had a trauma of seeing his father off himself in the head. Then he became a neglectful father for Lee. And how did Lee respond to the trauma? With hating the father. Because Lee didn't want to oceanic merge with the father's trauma. So a codependent that shares their trauma too much here. You all don't want to witness that. You don't want to witness it, the voicing wound. So you block it, you hate it, you, you criticize it for not having the perfect language, but the voicing wounds, by definition, don't have the perfect language. <laughs> the voicing wounds, by definition, flood other people. The voicing wounds kills identity. <laughs> it annihilates identity. Enmeshment annihilates identity. So we fight to differentiate. So if we could take away the roles, the role lock, we could sort out all these old stories. But we need to consider how do we get to the charge? Or how do we have controlled explosions? How do we have a crucible to burn off the extra charge, to burn off the impurities? It needs something with intelligence. Um, but understanding what happened to him actually helped me out a lot and kind of helped me release that anger, you know, helped me release that and let it go. You know, so that's part of my story right there. So he understood his dad more, so that allowed him to re some, release some of that hatred. This angle is sort of the same thing as uh, defenses. All ISTDP. defenses are memories. All defenses are memories. 
I'm just letting you register that, right? All the fences are memories. If the patient detaches from you, patient often. So defenses, splitting projection, projective identification. That's what I'm trying to link as oceanic union as one of the most scariest sides of splitting, splitting and projection. And the most tricky side of projection is projection, projective identification, because projective identification induces in you and everybody else counter transference. Counter transference is, is exciting. <laughs> and people don't like counter transference because you lose control, you get triggered by the person's projective identification, and then they have an excuse to attack you because you, you got triggered. <laughs> and then you're in union with their trauma and they're, you're trying to get them in union with your trauma and then it's just oceanic union. Uh, it's nice. <laughs> but underneath the projection is fearful of and depressed in the face of projection. So if you're on the receiving in a project projecting identification, it's supposed to trigger fear in you. And how many people welcome fear. I mean, many people are actively like scaring themselves to death all the time. People don't like feeling fear. So, people don't like projective identification. People don't know how to witness for that. No one's giving voice to the fear that gets triggered by projective identification and annihilation anxiety. So CPD cognitive perceptual disruption and the relationship. I'm afraid of you or angry with you for what I imagine you will do. You feel scary or I will make you act scary. <laughs> so then I will believe I have evidence that I'm afraid that you're going to attack me because I've projective identified on you. I've induced you to act scary <laughs> so I can be scared of you. And then when I'm scared of you, I can hate you and separate from you. And nobody speaks for the fear because you are now holding the fear that I've induced in you in oceanic union. <laughs> and the fear just gets uh, musical chairs, I guess. <laughs> so what we need is we need somebody as a co-historian to look and be curious, like, what's the adaptation? Sometimes it's showing you how someone detached from them. If a patient attacks herself, she's oftentimes showing you how she was attacked. Or she's showing you how she learned to attack herself in order to maintain a connection. If a patient projects and splits, oftentimes the patient is showing you how she grew up in a home where there was splitting and, and projection. So keep in mind, the defense is always a memory of adaptation. Every defense is a way of relating to you and every defense in a way is an enactment of a kind of relationship with you. The defense is always a memory of adaptation. So that's why, for instance, in isolation of affect, if the patient takes a detached stance, we'll say, notice how you put up this wall of detachment. And then we would have the same distant relationship here that you have with your wife and that you had with your father. So can we see what feelings are coming up here toward me? you're beginning to address the way the patient is enacting a past relationship with you. The patient learned I should attack myself and then my mother will calm down. So when the, instead, when the patient goes self-attack, we'll say, oh, could that thought be hurting you? Could that thought be unfair to you? Can we see what feelings are coming up here toward me if we look underneath those thoughts? Inviting feelings is actually inviting a new relationship. It's blocking an old enactment. And that enactment through using defenses is going to cause patient symptoms. Do you ignore So this is a tricky part. Inviting feelings. Starting new relationship. If we look underneath those thoughts. Inviting feelings is actually inviting a new relationship. It's blocking an old enactment. And that enactment through using defenses is going to cause patient symptoms. So when someone's in projective identification, someone's in oceanic union and flooding, if you were to invite feelings, 
that they don't trust that you don't trust that because you're feeling fear or they're feeling fear or both people fear is on the table annihilation anxiety is on the table <laughs> it's in the room who's going to invite feelings for a new relationship who's going to invite a new relationship pattern no one <laughs> So we enact some sort of defense, some sort of boundary protection that repeats the pattern. Repetition, compulsion, trauma bonding, oceanic union, outrage, replaying childhood stuff. That was an in-person meeting today. That uh, Towards the end, two people showed really strong patterns that most likely from their childhood. But since the group wasn't about mental health or narcissistic abuse, it was more about social anxiety and shyness. <laughs> I only lightly pointed it out. One guy had this dream that a monologuer would finally hear his story. He wanted tools so somebody so you could talk to a monologuer who's terrible at listening. And he even admitted that the monologuers are terrible at listening. <laughs> they wanted that someone terrible at listening to listen to his story. And then earlier in the meeting, he shared that his problem was his parents never listened to him. <laughs> and somehow he's obsessed about finding new person that is terrible at listening to him, monologuers, and figuring out that, oh, the Holy Grail is, I'll finally find someone to listen to me. Oceanic Union, projective identification, core childhood wounds. <laughs> Super common. So he's not inviting new relationship, he's trying to repeat an old relationship with a new person. But he's not giving the new person the, the new script. If you ignore your anxiety, then that, that would prevent us from being able to regulate. Well, yeah, but I don't want to look at it. Right. Well, if you don't look at your anxiety, and I don't look at your anxiety, then, then what kind of relationship would we have if, if we both ignore you? She's inviting you to do that. She's inviting an enactment. That's where we have to keep our attention. So given that you're inviting me to hurt you, can we see what feelings are coming up here toward me? These defenses are always enacting past relationships. And so we're having to think about how do we bring that to your patient's attention? And how do we make sure that our interventions are offering a new relationship rather than repeating the old relationship? All defenses are memories. The defense is always a memory of adaptation. Every defense is a way of relating to you, and every defense in a way is an enactment of a kind of relationship with you, offering a new relationship rather than repeating the old relationship. This is also tricky to do. <laughs> and all of this is sort of tricky to do. That's why you need the magic fourth, a responsive bystander, a co-historian. What you need in a friend is a co-historian. 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 What you need in a friend is a co-historian. 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 What you And I haven't figured out the exact formula for that, but a co-historian, a recent discovery is a co-historian is a person that can remember the good parts of you and the good parts of the relationship when you're triggered when you're splitting, when you're in projective identification. Or a group. You need a person, a therapist, or a group that can point to shared humanity, that can point to the old relationship when you weren't triggered, to the pattern of history that whoever you're projecting as all bad, as bad God, has some evidence of not being purely the demon spawn of Satan.
But if someone's triggered by projective identification, they're going to be acting out of some core evil defense that's really vicious. So that invitation is to get the other people in the group to moralize and invalidate and act out being dangerous. So if you start joining and by joining the dance, you're joining the counter-transference and the projective identification. You're not being a good co-historian, which is probably impossible. So this is just, it's not a reasonable ask, but we need somebody that can be co-historian to say, wait, <laughs> you two were having fun last week or for months, <laughs> or wait, let's wait out a couple of days and see if you're still angry. Let's not just jump on some reactive impulse. That's kind of boring and slow. So. <laughs> Co-historian in the magic fourth is hard to embody because therapists are moralizers. <laughs> Support groups are moralizers. We are, we're here to enforce behavior. We're not here to to blow everything up. Well, actually, wait, that's what I thought the group was about. But somehow the group has changed. <laughs> this is just supposed to be a shit show. I don't know why there's different expectations now. <laughs> And if it's a shit show that you guys survive, that means you learn something. You throw as much triggering stuff in, at, in the room, and the people see that <laughs> you didn't physically get hurt. Why isn't that a good deal? Where are we at? Oh, okay, this part. The origin of defenses is protecting parents from feelings that make them anxious so you can preserve the insecure attachment. So, of course, when people... So this is a tricky thing with projective identification and people, they get triggered. They get triggered and their defense is their expression of love to the parent. So if you judge their defense, you're judging their love for the parent. You're judging a latch-stitch desperation, love, fantasy bond, however you want to describe it. <laughs> a defensive adaptation of desperate love for the parent. That's, if you judge the defense, you're not witnessing it. You're judging it. You're judging that person's perverted love. As far as unconscious to unconscious body language. That's how the that's how the dance comes across. They've been divorced by their parent, so they have to act out some desperate defense, some moral defense, to show their love for their parent. They might act it out against the whole universe. They'll have a utopia dream that if I change the universe, finally my parent will love me, my parent will see me. So they'll be willing to murder tons of people in the world because <laughs> they want their parents' love. They want their the gratification. So if you take the easy bait of judging the moral defense and not trying to find the love, that's judging their love. So the person will cling more to defense if you judge it with moralizing. If you reach the core moral defense, if you reach a small moral defense, maybe you can talk it out. But if you reach the core wound, it's not going to be rational. You can't talk about rationally about it so this a case study is somebody who's more fragile so this is a a, a different way of working with uh, primitive defenses patients are using defenses with us they're protecting us too or who, who they think we are so when they say no 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 it's not toward you you get stuck and say well wait a second the patient's protecting me so who do i represent where, where she thinks she has to protect me yeah. And like, oh, yeah. wow, I represent this abusive mother. Yeah, of course, she's uh, yeah. trying to protect me. Yeah. Yeah, who do I, I represent where, where this is make total sense? This isn't bad. So when you're on the receiving end of someone's defense, you say, who do I represent? If someone's really hating you and they barely know you, or even if they know you and they're hating you for something that you don't seem to be, 
is there space to be a good co-historian and say, who do I represent? But that's hard to do. If you're triggered by being unseen, then you want to attack that person with your defense from your childhood and say, I want to be seen. <laughs> How dare you not see me? <laughs> so projective identification versus projective identification and squabbling. It's so beautiful. Why do we want to quash that in our group? <laughs> Somebody, maybe like uh, yeah. with videotape and we can have more co-historians, we'll try to say who represents who. But with some recent griping, maybe someone's griping that, oh, I'm not seen. I want to be seen by the parents. I have too many sisters and mom and no dad. I have to make a lot of noise just to be seen. I would just throw a bunch of noise in the comment section because I need to be seen. Could that be who the group represents to this person. <laughs> projective identification, projective identification. Great. We're getting close to core content. Why should we just try to shut down anybody? Let's try to look for the explosive charge. What are the feelings he has toward his girlfriend? Loving murderous feelings for his girlfriend. These trigger anxiety. What are the defenses he uses to do with his anxiety? He intellectualizes about it. When we're lucky. And then when we're not so lucky, what are the defenses he uses to deal with these mixed feelings for his girlfriend? He has rushing thoughts, self-tormenting, suicidal impulses, suicidal ideation, and then a psychotic break which is also defense against mixed emotions. A psychotic break is love. A lot of, a good amount of the cases that he's covered that have psychotic breaks, like the person had a life change and then they're trying to appease the parents' goals, <laughs> the hard rules, and then they have to navigate reality and they can't do both. So they have a psychotic break because they're actually trying to follow the parents and the family's rules <laughs> or their maladaptations to try to fit in their family and then their environment floods them with too much chaos. We see psychotic break and we say, throw some drugs at them. Oh, they're psychotic, let's be scary. But their psychotic break from this angle, it might be a defense that's the most extreme defense of love. I don't want to act out, have my murderous feelings towards my girlfriend, so I'll have a psychotic break. That's a sign of trying to limit da damage. But if we judge that as psych psychosis, then short-sighted. So we see the triangle of conflict is mixed feelings for the girlfriend, anxiety, and then if it, feelings aren't too high, he can still intellectualize. But when feelings get higher, yeah, he starts to have suicidal ideation, suicidal impulses, and then he has a psychotic break at an even higher level of feeling. Our task here is can we help him become conscious of these mixed feelings toward his girlfriend? Identify the hidden conflict. Keep the person in frustration, keep yourself in frustration, try to end, stay with the frustration to identify the, the mixed feelings, the hidden conflict. Then there's less chance of psychotic breaks. So he can have feelings rather than have to use such dangerous defenses against having feelings. You love her very much because you're not alone. And at the same time, this it it's, must be very confusing. How can I love someone and have the stabbing urge at the same time? And just noticing that complexity. That can be very confusing. And what's that like to notice? Yeah, these complex, contradictory feelings inside yourself at the same time. So the patient is talking about the stabbing urges. 
how many people here, like Holly or someone else, would want to judge the stabbing urges instead of being a co-historian to share the love that he also feels for the girlfriend? You push the stabbing urges into the unconscious, you push him more towards a psychotic break. You push him more towards a psychotic break, he might act out those stabbing urges. Oh, five years of failure that makes someone an expert at a, a, a method. <laughs> that doesn't even prove anything. Notice that I keep the pressure going longer so it leads to a new experience in him. If your pressure lasts a second, it won't have any impact. But if you let it last 10 or 15 seconds, then a shift can happen in him. So this is trusting the exposure. If you can stay with the frustration, you can get them to stay with the frustration, stay with the mixed feelings, trusting the exposure, trusting the expression. That's part of the process. It's keeping his, your pressure keeps his attention on the mixed feelings longer and that longer attention is actually building his affect tolerance. You're building his capacity to be aware of the mixed feelings for 15 seconds. And that's going to that's gonna lead to a change in capacity in him. So building capacity is, is invisible, Some is, often looks like nothing. And people sometimes will fight building capacity because working out is tiring. And unpleasant and sweaty and it's not comfortable. Building muscle is not fun. Reliving, building a fear muscle means you might need to feel some things that are scary. You need some exposure. How do you get, how do you, how do you get through it if you don't have some sort of exposure? titrated exposure, ideally, but sometimes you just got to work with what, what life gives you. So if life gives you a giant blast, then try to be a better co-historian. You've got to sometimes hold people in the intensity or figure out ways to drag it out. It would be exposure therapy, expose them to complex feelings in a way. Absolutely. Any, any, any good therapy is exposure. Because remember, all good psychoanalytic or psychodynamic therapy, right, is based on patients facing what they usually avoid. We're helping patients face what they avoid through defenses. And here, we're, our exposure is very specific. We're helping expose them to these contradictory urges, contradictory feelings, so he can bear mixed feelings without splitting. That's the key thing. And, and without projecting. So exposure and exposure for this guy, mixed feelings. For all good psychoanalytic or psychodynamic therapy, right, is based on patients facing what they usually avoid. We're helping patients face what they avoid through defenses. And here, we're, our exposure is very specific. We're helping expose them to these contradictory urges, contradictory feelings. So pressure to consciousness of splitting, staying in the frustration and identifying the hidden conflict, and maybe counter sabotage or counter transference uh, str strategies to sort of weaken people's language of agency. So some people in the chat might have amazing language of agency to write blame and sue this and that. All of those are defenses against feeling. Or all of those are defenses to say, oh, my inner child wants to be seen. But it's not describing what the inner child's need is. Actually, the pattern might be the inner child wants to be schooled. It needs a parent. So how to how can we be a loving parent for them? How can the group be a, a loving, disciplining parent for this needy child that has a lot of language of agency? So he can bear mixed feelings without splitting. 
that's the key thing and and without projecting so if you help a person bear mixed feelings build more capacity then there's less uh, stress that's going to cause splitting and projection And that happens through exposure. And that's one of the potential gifts of this group, to flood people with exposure. And the more people in the group that we have that can trigger other people, the better the group is. Because the group is also trying to prepare you for narcissistic abuse, uh, for manipulative uh, relationships. So don't you want the scariest sparring partners here So the target, remember the enemy. The enemy is like real dangerous people. The enemy is uh, people that can have a genuine psychotic break. So my therapist said, you and your eyes go dark, you log out of your mind. It could be a psychotic break. It feels like they're a completely different person. It feels like they're no longer at home. Then they could be experiencing possibly a psychotic break. They've logged out. They don't have no idea what they've done. Their body was there, but their mind was gone. They can be having fun, making, seeing you in pain, uh, making you scared and being fearful. The eyes could become big dilated. And sometimes they don't remember. They don't remember what they've done. They don't remember what they put you through. It could be, you know, a super manic high, you know, a manic high, manic explosion, whatever, or a psychotic break. In my real life, I was talking to my wife like this is a canvas picture that my wife had made of me and her like we were like kissing or something like that and she had it printed out and it was on, it was on our wall the picture went missing I was like, what the hell is that picture so i found it in my son's closet in the back of the closet and it was sliced up we she got angry and cut it up and put it in the back of the closet because she wanted to remember whatever you know whatever happened that day and i was gonna throw it away but i was just like he discovered this sliced up picture and his logic was the wife did it. <laughs> Must have did it because women crazy, time of the month or something, blah, blah, blah. So he takes it up with his wife. No, I'm just leaving it in there because that you know she'll throw it away when she's ready. And we were in bed one night and I told her, I was just like, hey, look, that picture that um, in the closet, like, when are you going to throw that away? And she's like, what picture? I like the picture that you uh, sliced up and put in... Uh, our son's you closet, like, why, stuff. like, when are you gonna be ready to throw it away? And y'all, the look on her face, like, her eyes got wide, and she looked at me, and she was like, you cut that picture up. It's okay that you cut it up, I understand why you did it, we were, it was not a good time. She was like, you did it, and she was like, I'm gonna prove it. I'm like, how can you prove it? It's been in that closet forever. So she scrolled back in her text messages to like 2018, y'all. Like, her, she was texting her aunt, she was like, I'm really scared right now. She's like, uh, Demond's going through the house. He's super angry. He's like, his eyes don't look the same. Like he's humming and whistling. Like he just took a picture off the wall and cut it up and he threw it into the closet. <laughs> he like took it and threw it to the closet. Like, this is the only part about that situation that I remember is like, my wife opened the door and the police came in. That's literally the only thing I remember. She said, to this day, when the police came in, and you acted like you had been doing anything. She's like, that was scary as hell. She's like, because I, I, I told her, I like, because. He doesn't have to play dumb because his mind, psychotic break, he forgets his conscious mind. And when he breaks out of the psychotic break, he doesn't remember the break. Doesn't have to play dumb. Because I don't remember doing anything. Like when, when the police came in the door, it's like I woke up. It's like a part of me took off running and hid hid within me. In the entire time we've been ha 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 he he together, I've never been more scared. Like that's the only time I've really been scared of you, because like you were not you. It's just like I was trying to get you to calm down. I was talking to you and you were just like screaming and you were just whistling and humming. Your eyes would look different. Like I knew you weren't there, so that's why I started talking to my aunt. You know, and then the police showed up and then you were just smiling with the police, joking with them and stuff like that, asking why they were there. And I was scared. I was even scared because like you, you, it seemed like you were somebody different. I was like, because I was, I had no idea, y'all. When your anger reaches its threshold, like your mind protects itself by shutting down and the other, the narcissistic part of you takes over. I was like, dang, that is wild. 
I talk more, I communicate more, I get my emotions out on the table, but that doesn't happen again. Cause I don't want that to happen again. Yeah, who wants to help back out and do some craziness like that? Not me. Like when, when the police came in the door, it's like I woke up, it's like a part of me took off running and hid within me, it hid within me, it hid within me. So this is a, a personal story of a genuine psychotic break. So if you guys are so confident of facing a psychotic break, this is what you're, you're doing. You're inviting by calling out psychosis and trying to pressure someone's defense to force someone into healing. <laughs> Just be ready for the potential psychotic break if you want to go that direction. Hopefully we can record it, make it fun. But let's soften it back to just uh, the crisis of hatred. And oh, Nick is joining. Welcome, welcome Nick. You missed all the scary stuff. Now it will be boring. Maybe not. Crisis of Hatred, Ivan Agazarian still has some nuggets, even though the rest of the SCT people seem like idiots. Is that slander? When you've got traumatized people, their boundaries. This would be the definition of the support group, CPTSD traumatized. When you've got traumatized people, their boundaries are closed and they're related to the instinctive part of themselves as well as the animal brain. If you ask them a question, questions are leadership behaviors. They are threat. Questions are also interrogations. Questions are also signs of torture. So they might trigger language of agency defenses. More interrogation. More interrogation. More. Come on. Come on. I am listening, I promise. I am listening, I promise. I am listening. Keep give me the address. 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 You pressure people with questions that can amplify annihilation anxiety. It can overexpose people. So learn how to ask questions with precision which means that the only communication is the system of projective identification. One Oceanic Union. Has to be able to experience and not fight off the overwhelming experience of projective identification of the oceanic, terrifying annihilation anxiety. But Look. Yvonne, from the past, because she's dead now, she linked projective identification with annihilation anxiety and oceanic and mixed them all together. <laughs> Part of my thesis, and also linked to projective identification and oceanic uni union from the Jungian people. It might be all the same territory, and that's also the territory of paranoia. Because when you have no boundaries, because you're in oceanic union, you can't identify safety and danger. You can't identify when the next split is coming. You've lost nuance because you've been enmeshed, and it's annihilation of identity. Identification of the oceanic, terrifying annihilation anxiety that afflicts all of us when we are the receiver of a projective identification. Annihilation anxiety, to feel like you're invaded, that you've been taken over, that you're going crazy, that this isn't anything to do with me. And... Oh, there. This has nothing to do with me. So if you're on the receiving end of projective identification, you want to reject it. <laughs> it's not me. It's not my identity. It's an invasion. But if you react to it with your natural reaction, you're falling into the induction. You're joining in the dance. Therapists suck at this, so support people 
support group people also should suck at it. Unconscious to unconscious communication is designed to pull your strings and make your behavior match the induction. No one's being a co-historian for being human. No one's being a co-historian for being an adult. That's why trolling is so much fun for some people. Of course, it's the projective identification which, as you develop tolerance of it, allows you to interact at a level that is not words, in which the patient or the group and you gradually contain what was uncontainable before. Oceanic, terrifying, annihilation anxiety gradually contain annihilation anxiety. So other people need to gradually contain the annihilation anxiety, and often the other people need to remember it because the person who's triggered by the annihilation anxiety is going into projective identification and trying to induce somebody else to play the role of bad god or bad person. It's not easy. But let's give another angle of annihilation anxiety, time distortion. So maybe this is why everybody needs to do mushrooms and other things that distort our time. Benzodiazepine withdrawal did that was absolutely dreadful was produce a sense of time distortion. So this was really obvious when I first woke up in Russia. Like the first day that you and I could speak again, you were wheeling me around in the aisle of the corridor of the intensive care unit. We were going to wheel, I was going to be wheeled around until it was time for time to eat. Mm -hmm. And I must have asked you how many times in 10 minutes what time it was. Probably every 45 seconds. Yeah, probably something like that. Yeah. I didn't do it this bad in my mushroom trip, but I recall asking about the time at least three times or four times around the two hour, two and a half hour mark. <laughs> or going in, also I remember, like <laughs> 30 minutes. So I was trying to track time, but I couldn't remember the memory because the chemicals were fucking up something. Benzo withdrawal also fucks up your time um, registers, but really bad. Yeah. And that's because for me, it felt like, you know, a substantial amount of time had passed, an hour, two hours, something like that. Some terrible amount of time. And so not only was I in pain and experiencing extremely high levels of anxiety, the duration of time had extended so that it was really unbearable. It was like the days were just lasting forever. And that's thank, that actually disappeared quite a bit as the yeah. akathisia disappeared. And it, it isn't the case now, thank God, but it was, it was brutal. It's funny, even now, you know, because it's somewhat stressful to have this conversation, I can feel if I lift up my eyes, my eyebrows a bit, yeah. like you might when you're interested in something. I can feel the Go back tremors and tremors in my forehead, and that's partly stress-induced. So we should probably stop talking. Yeah. So, time distortion, and if the minutes stretch into the into days, or the days seem like they last forever and you have a negative filter around this oceanic union of time distortion. Of, I'm almost on the cliff of annihilation. <laughs> or this caving in feeling that, it, that feels like hell. That's kind of scary. So if narcissists have access to schizoid empty core, they can distort time and space and reality. Time distortion mess with people's sense of urgency, mental looping, and sense of disorientation. So word salad or contagioning the love bombing target with time distortion, disorientation, oceanic union, flooding. Do they do it? We'll message you at sense of time, you know, 
and things of that nature. I mean, some of them will actually do it by changing the time zone clocks and things like that. I've seen, I've, I've seen stories about narcissistic people in the self work in the self aware narcissist group, like setting people's clocks back one minute every single day. So at, you know, every single day for like two, three weeks. So their 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 clocks that they they live on you know, are fifteen minutes behind or something like that. And they are always 15 minutes late and they're just messing with their heads and stuff like that. So some narcissistic people absolutely just try to drive you crazy by messing with your time. Yes. He was going out all the way. He was doing it. He was doing the clock in the car. He was like getting up early to do it. It was crazy. It was it was crazy. He was and people in the group were egging were egging them on. It was like some of them, like some of the self-worth narcissist groups are like mean girls. Some some self worth narcissists like being bad people, y'all. I'm just telling you, self awareness, self awareness does not mean that you're going to be a good person. It does not guarantee some some kind of sense of morality is coming out of nowhere. Self awareness just means you know what's going on now. Oh, another angle is we've gotten disconnected from from nature. So this is all right. Maybe I'll close with that sort of stuff. That theory. So this is a, a person who does deep deep sea diving. So it's shortly after that submarine imploded and killed a bunch of billionaires. Carbon fiber. So he he works in that ar ar arena. Victor Vescovo. I do think that there is a tendency in media and in human psychology to panic. I also try to look very coldly and clinically at data and what are the biases that are potentially inherent in data. So I think I kind of think like a scientist and it's really hard. This happens every 15 or 20 years. Let's go back to 1940s. The Nazis are coming to power. They're going to destroy the world. The atomic bomb was dropped. Oh my God, we're going to have nuclear Armageddon. Well, it didn't happen. Bad things happened, but not that, and it didn't end the world. Then in the 1970s, there was this so-called population bomb. We're going to run out of food. Well, then you had the Green Revolution, and that didn't happen. One of my favorites is in the year 1000, the Pope banned crossbows, because with the invention of the crossbow, they thought, oh my God, a peasant can kill a knight. The world is absolutely going to end now. Every generation, at least a slice of the population, seems almost to want to believe that they live in the most apocalyptic time. Freud said that annihilation anxiety is seductive because it allows our unconscious minds to process that which our conscious minds cannot, which is our own mortality, our own deaths. Yeah. It's a it, collective death. Right, and maybe that's one reason why I do have the attitude I do that I just described is because I think I've been through so much. I, I've learned how to control fear in many respects. I mean, so controlling fear in many respects, and what are some ways that he inoculated himself from some of this annihilation anxiety? And just given what I do, and therefore it's just something that I don't have to pander to. I, I treat it very clinically and yeah. logically, uh, and coldly, because sometimes that's how nature works. Um, so you've experienced the raw force of nature. The whole construct is mastery of nature. It's not experiencing right, the raw power. Right, it's very human-centered. We are the center of the universe. We are all powerful. We determine our fate. We're going to do this and that. But nature has a way of reminding you that she is completely unforgiving, and you must re treat it with respect. Self-delusion. There's a great quote by my expedition leader, Rob McCallum, who said, you, know, you don't come away wounded from the deep ocean. You either come back or you don't. So and it's kind of with the high mountains as well. So yeah. you have to treat it with a lot of respect and human beings just don't seem to have a lot of humility sometimes about that. Annihilation anxiety is seductive because it allows our unconscious minds to process that which our conscious minds cannot. So if you spend your time wrestling with annihilation anxiety, you're sort of wrestling with humanity or God. Where if you wrestle with nature, you get to see life or death. So you get to be humbled by the actual dangers of real life consequences. And not only that, you might get a high 
if you actually wrestle with real danger. Humans are evolved, obviously, to deal with trauma. I mean, eventually, I mean, if trauma was incapacitating to people for years or lifetimes, we wouldn't exist, right? I mean, our history as a species involved a huge amount of trauma. So we are designed to react to trauma by protecting ourselves emotionally and physically for a certain amount of time, for some weeks or months, maybe a year or two, and then to slowly come out of it and continue functioning. That's exactly what happened to me. The problem with affluent modern society is it takes away all of the tasks of survival, right? No one in this room, I don't think, is having to figure out every morning how to literally physically survive. Where am I going to get the berries I'm going to eat today? Where am I going to go to kill something that I can eat? How am I going to avoid the enemy? Like, we're not thinking like that. Which is an enormous blessing, right? I mean, it's an enormous luxury to live like that. The downside is you don't get this sense of mastery over your circumstances. You actually don't feel responsible for your own survival. That's a very profound insight, actually, into what makes people feel like they're leading a worthy life. So if you walk around and ask people on the street, what would you die for? Who or what idea would you die for? I mean, people wouldn't have an answer for most of human history. The immediate answer would be, well, I'd die for my people, right? Of course, like our encampment gets attacked by the enemy. I would die defending this place. We live in safety and luxury, which is lovely but it deprives people of a sense of purpose and meaning. If you wake up in the morning and your survival is a kind of question mark, and you know that you have to act well and with clarity and precision and quickness in order to survive, that is intoxicating, right? The challenge of that's intoxicating and you feel like you're sort of earning your existence. And when you leave that, it's a relief, but it's also a disappointment because you're no longer earning anything. And in that disappointment, you can get quite depressed. So clearly what makes people feel good is challenge, not ease. Yeah. And that's the conclusion I draw. And not just challenge, but challenge in the context of a community of people. We live in safety and luxury, which is lovely, but it deprives people of a sense of purpose and meaning. You don't get this sense of mastery over your circumstances. You actually don't feel responsible for your own survival. So this sense of mastery is also two different satisfactions. Do you want your ego that's a reality tester to help navigate mastery and get some sense of mas some, some sense of navigating reality and some mastery, or do you just want to satisfy very primitive id or super ego gratification? Right? So are you chasing short-term gratifications, or are you going to try to pursue a path of adult mastery? The adult mastery is harder to achieve, but the highs are more satisfying. Gratification you can get, but it's fleeting and you got to keep stuffing yourself with more and more and more. And you get more and more stagnant and depressed. My intuition is if we can just get used to witnessing the voicing, maybe everything gets easier. But haven't figured out that map. Because when we're in the phase of projective, if someone's projective identifying us, they're triggering our counter counter transference. But what's the gist of counter transference of why we're triggered? Because we don't like being invis invisibilized. <laughs> we don't like being objectified. We don't like being seen. We don't we don't like being objectified, and then having an outrageous charge dumped on us. It's unfair, sure but it's human nature. And if we're hanging around trauma survivors, it's probably the norm of the territory. So it's just a matter of time until someone's gonna projective identify on us. So can we bear the wound of being divorced? And it's not probably not even being divorced. It's just because we've been abused in the past. So we want never again shall I be divorced. But if we're responding in moral outrage to one person that's the voicing us, 
That's just one voice that we're turning into God. We're turning into good parent, bad parent. How can we outgrow this, this tendency? I have these same tendencies on YouTube comments. So I'll try to chase and force that person to be nice to me. So I'm not immune from this either. 